Good day, everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sari and Professor Department Chair. So this is going to be a demonstration of the base of the skull. The foramina in the various compartments of the base of the skull, the structures passing through them, as well as their important clinical correlations. So this is the anterior cranial fossa. This is the middle cranial fossa. And this is the posterior cranial fossa. More specifically, this is the cerebellar fossa. The anterior cranial fossa is occupied by the frontal lobe. The middle cranial fossa is occupied by the temporal lobe. And the posterior cranial fossa below is occupied by the cerebellum and above the tentorium cerebelli is the occipital lobe of the brain. Now let's come back to the anterior cranial fossa. This is the frontal crest. And you can see one opening here. This is called the foramen cecum. What does this do? This gives passage to an emissary vein. This emissary vein, it passes from the nasal cavity. It goes up from the nasal cavity and then it pierces through the foramen cecum and then it connects with the superior sagittal sinus which runs on the undersurface of the calvarium. So therefore, if any infection were to travel from the nose, it will go through this emissary vein and it will produce superior sagittal sinus thrombosis. What happens when a patient has got SSS thrombosis? He will have headache, altered cerebrum, altered sensorium, altered mentation and he will have weakness of both the legs because of involvement of the medial surface of the cerebral cortex. That happens when a person is dehydrated in a warm climate. So this is about foramen cecum. Then we have these two plates of bones. These are very thin plates of bones and these are known as the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone. And passing through them are the various phyla olfactoria, that is the various filaments of the olfactory nerve CN1. How do they pass? Again, they pass through the roof of the nasal cavity and then they pierce through the various openings in the cribriform plate and then they go into the olfactory bulb which is located right under like this under the frontal lobe of the brain. If a person sustains a road traffic accident and has got an injury in the front frontal bone it can lead to fracture of the cribriform plate of ethmoid bone and that will lead to loss of smell sensation because of injury of the olfactory nerves. Additionally because of tear of the dura there will be CSF leakage from his nose and that is called CSF rhinorrhea. He will have inhalation of air into the frontal lobe and that is called traumatic frontal aerosine and he can develop ascending meningitis. So that's about this. Now let's move further back. We can see this opening here. This is the optic canal. This gives passage to the optic nerve and the ophthalmic artery. We can have optic neuritis because this is closely related to the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone forms the medial wall of the orbit. It forms the medial wall of the orbit and medial wall of the orbit is the lateral wall of the nasal cavity and the medial wall of the orbit is very thin. It is called lamina papyracea. So therefore, ethmoidal sinusitis can easily travel into the orbit and it can produce optic neuritis. We can also get a condition known as orbital pseudotumor where the orbit gets filled with a fibrous tissue like structure which can also involve the optic nerve. Now let's go further. We are now in the middle cranial fossa and we can see this opening here under the sphenoidal crest. This is the superior orbital fissure. This superior orbital fissure, it gives passage to CN3, 4, V1, 6, the superior inferior of thalmic veins and it also gives passage to the sympathetic plexus. We can get involvement of this superior orbital fissure in a condition known as SOF syndrome, also called the Tolosa Hunt syndrome which can involve one or more of these cranial nerves and it will lead to injury and paralysis of these cranial nerves. It can also lead to Horner syndrome because of involvement of the sympathetic plexus which travels through this superior orbital fissure into the orbit. The next structure is this one, this is the foramen rotundum. Then behind that we have the foramen ovale and then we have the foramen spinosum. Any of these can be involved in fracture of the middle cranial fossa. But more relevant is when we have a fracture of the middle cranial fossa, we can have injury to this plate of bone that we can see here. This is referred to as the tegment tympani or the tegmental roof of the tympanic cavity because this is the thinnest part and a fracture of this can lead to leakage of CSF and blood through the external auditory meatus and that is known as CSF autoria. Going further posteriorly, now we are in the posterior cranial fossa. We have the internal auditory meatus. 
Passing through this internal artery meatus, we have CN7, CN8, and the labyrinthine artery. We can have involvement of the CN7 here, and that is known as Bell's palsy because the CN7 passes through this and it goes through a canal inside the petrous temporal bone, which is called the facial canal. And then the CN7 comes out through this opening here. This is the stylomastoid foramen. So therefore, the facial nerve can be involved in this facial canal and that is called Bell's palsy. We can have acoustic schwannoma involving the eighth cranial nerve. And that can also involve the CN7 in this condition here. We can have herpes zoster orticus or Ramsey-Hunt syndrome in this internal auditory meatus. Then we come to this big opening here, jagged opening. This is the jugular foramen. If you look carefully, the jugular foramen has got two components, a posterior component and an anterior component. The posterior component gives passage to the continuation of the sigmoid sinus, which becomes the superior bulb of the internal jugular vein, and after that it becomes the internal jugular vein. And going also through the posterior compartment, we have cranial number numbers CN9 and 10. Through the anterior portion, we have passage of CN11 and also the inferior petrosal sinus, which runs down like this. We can have involvement of these structures in what is known as the jugular foramen syndrome. That is actually glomus jugular tumor, which is actually a tumor of the glomus cells, which involves the superior bulb of the internal jugular vein, and it can lead to paralysis of CN9, 10, and 11. And it can also extend further. It can rarely involve even CN12. It can even involve CN7 and 8. So that's glomus jugular tumor, tumor producing jugular foramen syndrome. So these are some important foramina in the base of the skull that we have mentioned. Just to complete the story, what are the structures which pass through these foramen? Passing through the foramen rotundum, we have maxillary nerve, CN5, V2. Passing through the foramen ovale, we have mandibular division of trigeminal nerve, CN5V3. Also passes from here will be the lesser petrosal nerve and also the accessory meningeal artery, which will enter from the infratemporal fossa into the cranial cavity. Then we have the foramen spinosum. Passing through this is the middle meningeal artery, which will require special mention. And also passes through this is the nervous spinosus or the recurrent branch of mandibular nerve, which supplies the meninges. The middle meningeal artery, once it comes from here, it divides into an anterior division and a posterior division. The anterior division runs on the inner surface of the terion. The terion is located here. And if there is an injury to the lateral surface of the temporal bone, it can lead to fracture of the terion and rupture of the anterior division of middle meningeal artery here, which will produce an extradural hematoma, which can be a potentially life-threatening condition. And finally, we have this opening here. This is the foramen lacerum. It is called lacerum because it is lacerated in, on the appearance. In life, it is covered by a plate of cartilage. And the internal carotid artery, which passes through this canal here, this is the carotid canal. It runs through the carotid canal and then it goes over the cartilage and then it enters into this cavernous sinus here. So this is the foramen lacerum and it carries with it the sympathetic plexus. The cavernous sinus can be involved on either side of the sphenoid bone in sphenoidal sinusitis and that will produce what is known as cavernous sinus syndrome. Passing through the cavernous sinus, we have CN3, 4, V1, V2 and 6 and the sympathetic plexus. One or more of these can be involved in cavernous sinus syndrome. And finally, a fracture or injury to the base of the skull can also produce what is known as carotico-cavernous fistula because the internal carotid artery also runs through the cavernous sinus. And if that happens, then we can get what is known as pulsating ectophthalmos and a brewy over the frontal region of the skull. So these are some salient points about the various cranial fossa, their foramen, the structures passing through them and the clinical correlations. Thank you very much for watching. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal signing out. Solomon is the camera person. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day. Please like and subscribe.